Today, fake blood still stains the gates outside the White House. Over the weekend, a pro-Hamas march ended at the White House, where protesters tried to break in and break through the gates. They called for the end of Israel. They demanded more terrorist attacks against Jews. All the things, sadly, that we've come to expect over the past few weeks. And, of course, everybody has the right to free speech, full stop. But violence and breaking into buildings are different things. There's laws against that. But despite the destruction at the White House and around Lafayette Park, and as you can see, sticking flagpoles through the White House fence, not one person got arrested. Charles Marino knows a lot about protecting the White House. He protected three different presidents during his decades with the Secret Service and joins us now, sir. Um, it's good to see you. Thank you. Are you surprised you nobody got arrested? No, it's not that surprising. Look, you had a very precarious, volatile situation uh, where the Secret Service needed to focus on the inside of the fencing to secure the White House proper. You had the U.S. Park Police and Metropolitan Police managing the crowd on the other side of the fence going towards Lafayette Square. So it doesn't surprise me that no action was taken right then and there. I think we'll see some action taken uh, in the weeks following to identify some of these folks that went above and beyond peaceful demonstration. But I think they made the right call uh, hmm. in, that, in that situation. I guess it's confounding to me, because I think if I, even as somebody by myself, jumped up on the White House fence and started shaking it back and forth, um, I'd get a, a pretty solid tackle from uh, a lot of the Secret yeah. Service uniform division that's out outside. Uh, I'm just wondering, who makes the decision? Who decides, OK, uh, we're going to just stand back and, and protect the fence line versus we're going to start throwing tear gas and not allow this kind of behavior to happen? Who, who in the end, makes that decision? Yeah, well, let's remember, the numbers were in nobody's favor on law enforcement that day. Normal Saturday staffing is not going to achieve the large number of people estimated to be 30,000 that congregated within Lafayette Square and along the White House fence line. So uh, there was a process in place, a decision-making process. Uh, you can see some of those videos. Uh, it became quite a precarious situation, as I describe yeah. it. You saw some movement in the fencing. Ultimately, they were able to peacefully disperse the crowd. Um, but law enforcement was not in the best of situations. I think they're going to go back, review. That permit was authorized for up to 100,000. When was it granted? Why was it granted? Was that the right decision? And was there the level of coordination prior to that decision being made that needed to be taken to ensure that everybody was set up for success? Yeah, for, forgive me, but it just it seems as though to have knowledge that that many people are coming and then not to be ready for for this to happen seems uh, curious. I mean, I, I can't quite figure yeah. it out. And I mean, you, you don't have to talk about operational security, but uh, from having been on the White House grounds, I know there's an awful lot of tear gas and other things sitting in, in those guard shacks that that could have been deployed and, and wasn't. But I'm wondering when you see these these marches now that are popping up around the country, especially in Washington and especially around uh, the Capitol and now outside the White House. Do we have any intel on who's organizing these things, on whether there are foreign actors and agitators trying uh, to push this narrative? I, don't, I, can't get, I can't get 50 people to show up for a free donut, much less 50,000. Yeah, my understanding is this permit was filed under the March of Palestine. I don't understand. Uh, you know, who exactly was in charge of this group. In other words, who put their names forth as sponsors of this group, what their affiliations were or weren't. I would hope that the issuing uh, authority, the National Park Service, uh, would have vetted that information to find out exactly who they are. But, of course, there's a lot of social media monitoring huh. Uh, on the part of law enforcement to determine exactly how many people plan on showing up uh, and what the I, intentions I, I, are. Me, I, and sometimes that's the cause for violence. I, I guess by what I'm hearing from you is basically that you're saying that the Secret Service and Park Police were too outnumbered, forgive me for saying this, but to do their job. Well, I think, look, nothing happened to the White House. 
Uh, it didn't put the Secret Service in the best of positions regarding numbers. I think you saw everybody shrink back to their overall statutory responsibilities. The Secret Service went on the inside of the fence line. They were prepared to do what they needed to do, even though a protectee, the president and the first lady, were in Rehoboth, Delaware. They were still poised to protect the building and the grounds uh. and the people that were inside. You saw the park police take over what their statutory responsibilities are from the outside of the fence line along yeah, I, the I, I guess, Charles, I, 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 police. Look, Ow. I, look I, I, I have a lot of respect for the Secret Service. I always have. Um, I, I, I was attacked in Lafayette Park once during one of these, these things, so I understand I how combustible they are. Thanks for watching. Go to joinnn.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.